What would you think if I were to say, now before we enter into this sermon, let's show everybody and God included how much we really have enjoyed our worship of God and let's just give him a hand and give a big applause. What would you think about that? You know, we often talk about whatsoever you do. Well, I'm talking about something we would do, could do, some do. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means by his authority. Give me thanks to God the Father by him. Well, that authority set out the words of the New Testament. And what keeps the Lord's church just that? Belonging to the Lord. And pleasing to the Lord. Is our adherence to his word. In recent years, it's been a good while now, but still recently, <clears throat> comparatively speaking, when it comes to the Lord's church, there have been certain congregations that after baptisms, they would applaud. Sometimes for other reasons they would. First time I ever came across it was when I think I attended a congregation in southern Arkansas where I believe it was the Abilene College at that time college chorus had was performing and that's what they were doing and uh, at the end of the song there was a little slight clatter of applause and the, and the director got up and said don't worry that's fine go ahead and give them applause if you'd like to um, and several did and people sometimes who are not oriented to saying, now, did that please the Lord? And if it did, it must be taught in the scriptures. They don't think. They come from backgrounds that don't cause them to consider anything like that. I would first of all say in questioning, is it scriptural to clap, to applause? I would say think of the way worship has been carried out in the New Testament. Think of the way worship even was carried out by the Jews in the Levitical priesthood. Think of the seriousness, the sobriety that was characteristic of the attitude of the people engaged in worship because when we come together in an assembly like this to worship, we're worshiping God. We're on display to God to show him from each one of our hearts as we collectively are here how much we adore him. Sometimes we sing the song, Christ, we do all adore thee. Our Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. And all sorts of songs that emphasize revering God that it's not a time of flippantness and lightness. It is a time of, of that which is serious and sobering. So from time to time, the question comes up concerning the practice of applause or clapping during our worship periods. And the whole idea is, is this just another way of saying amen? And one fellow years ago wrote and said clapping, applause is just another way of saying amen. Well, my first uh, thought about that when he said that's all it is, is well then why don't I find it in the New Testament? Where do I find a direct statement? An implied or an example of clapping or applause being just another way of saying amen. And what is wrong with sticking with what we absolutely know is correct? You notice at the end of the prayers we say amen. Now it's true we need to understand what we're saying when we say amen. It means so be it. It means I'm in full agreement with what has just been uh, said by the leader. And sometimes uh, when we're preaching then a point is made and someone or several in the audience will say, Amen. Well, when you read through the New Testament, you find cases like that. 
My question, I guess, would be why can't we be content with the way the New Testament says was acceptable to God? Why must we add something like that when we have no direct statement, no example, or no implication in the Word of God that applause or clapping is fine? So this practice, generally speaking, is relatively new among Churches of Christ. The fact within itself doesn't, of course, make the practice either right or wrong. Neither does the fact that it's a practice borrowed from our denominational neighbors from the entertainment industry mean that it's right to do so. You see, this thing comes about because people change their view of what worship is in the first place. There were other things that began to come out about the time I was in college and grew more and more into this day. And that was just a change completely of the whole attitude of people in the very worship assembly. And that's when it came down to, well, what are you doing to please me? What are you doing to entertain me? Which is totally against why we assemble on the first day of the week. We assemble to please God. We assemble to worship God. We assemble, as it were, to bow down to God, to show our devotion to God. And God has told us in His Word how He wants to be worshipped. Surely we, as people saved by God through Christ and our love of the truth and obedience to the gospel, will respect such a thing as that. So the rightness or wrongness of any act is not determined what the people want, but it's determined by the authority of the New Testament. People have tried to make out that it's just traditional among churches of Christ to sing and not use any kind of mechanical instrument or music, as if that's the only reason that we don't use mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God when it comes to music. But that's wrong. It may be traditional, meaning handed down. That's all tradition means, but you can hand down error just like you can hand down truth. Well, among faithful churches of Christ, it's traditional. We hand down the truth concerning New Testament worship by noticing the word of Jesus Christ, who we say is our king. Well, his word's law if he's our king. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Thus, what Christ teaches in his last will and testament, which is the only place you can find what pleases Christ today, is that we sing when it comes to worship of God. So it's not just the sense that's just the way we've always done it. If, if that was all there is to it, then we would have to say, well, uh, maybe we shouldn't have air conditioning because hundred years ago, most churches didn't have air conditioning, and that was traditional to them. Well, I'll tell you one thing. A hundred years ago back, they wished they had air conditioning. And as soon as people got to where they could, they did, because it has no bearing whatsoever on the acts of worship. But it certainly does make it more comfortable in hot weather. So to do, and the same is true of warm weather. Now, we live in an area of the country where we get more concerned about being cool than we do about being hot. But I think if you came from where Brett came from originally, we'd be pretty concerned about being warm as much as we're concerned about being cool. Well, all of that just expedites the atmosphere where we can be comfortable and do what's authorized by the Scriptures. We don't have to have a building to worship in right now. But I like it a whole lot better in here than I do with that wind blowing out there under those trees. It's expedient. It's advantageous to carrying out what we're obligated to do, in this case, simply to worship God and in worshiping Him, worship Him according to His will. So I simply say, first of all, what do you learn from the New Testament of your Lord, your Savior, your King, Jesus Christ, as to His will about worshiping? So we're not just interested in saying, well, we haven't always done it, so we can't do it. That's not the point. Not the point at all. 
I will say this concerning the change agents in the church, that clapping applause during worship fits into the agenda of those who are trying to change the church. Now, what do we mean when we say change the church? Well, we're not talking about that which expedites and uh, uh, that which is an obligation. Here, when we remodel this building, we change some things with these fans, certainly change it over with the screens, we change it over the PA system, but none of that added to the Word of God. In fact, when people got to where they could have a public address system, we were glad to get it. Made it a lot easier to do what God obligated us to do in the way of teaching the truth, helping in the worship. And we could worship God in song without song books. And there are places where they're so poor in what's called third world countries, they don't have song books. It's always interesting to see how they compensate for that because they haven't got all those songs memorized. So the leader many times may have the only book and he'll read through the phrase real quick and then they'll sing it. And read through the next phrase and they'll sing it. And so on. Always going to compensate according to what you have. But again, I say concerning applause, where is there the direct statement, the example, or that which is implied that says it's just another way of saying, so be it. I'm in agreement with it. Amen. I know we don't do it much, but I would have no problem if somebody cried hallelujah. Now, there's a way you go about things. We don't usually do that much. We don't have a problem with somebody saying amen. So things like that can be done and done with proper decorum because of why we're here. What we talk about all the time many times gets missed in churches, but always has to be taught about and should be done in the home. And that is teaching people how they ought to act in worship, how they ought to conduct themselves. That doesn't begin after children are grown. It begins from the time they're little, when they start learning. Well, some of my fondest recollections as I think of them now is when I was just a little tyke, sitting by my grandmother and my mother because daddy wasn't a member of the church yet. And I can still remember singing with them. Some of the songs I know now I first learned in that way. I remember my mother singing while she fixed dinner or whatever else. Those songs stick with you. There is a way to teach, a way to set a proper example, a way to get the truth across and not simply some sort of three-ring circus, a dog and pony show, some kind of uh, entertainment act like in Las Vegas. And yet that's what people think of many times today when it comes to worship, and that's the reason it gets so easy, easily brought in when it comes to applause. A fellow by the name of Calvin Warpula, who's roughly my age or a little older, who was one of the folks back when I was young, a leader in, in liberalism and apostasy, made this comment. I also believe we should let individuals and congregation use the musical format they like without judging them. Well, doesn't he realize that he just judged somebody to be able to make that statement? If he wasn't judging somebody, why, what was the purpose of making that statement? What message did he convey? Rubel Shelley said that the tired, uninspiring event we call worship in traditional churches has to give way to the exhilarating experience of God that exhibits and nourishes life in the worshipers. Well, tell me, from the heart of a dedicated Christian and all the Bible defines a Christian to be, when that person has purposely assembled with others of like precious faith and like mindedness, that as they sing the songs that we've sung and pray as we ought to due to our own faithfulness and dedication, how is it tired? There was actually a, a book written about this time, not by a member of the church. Are you going to church and enjoying it less? That's some of that same thing. And people in the church borrowed that for those not members of the church who begin to say 
the same thing. Shelley also said in the same speech, the church has got to change. If it doesn't change, my kids are not going to stay with it. Well, I guess a lot of folks believe that. But it does not make what he said true. I know, not if, ands, or buts, or maybes, but I know that when God shut Noah and Ms. Noah in, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and each one of their wives, and brought in, in the ark, and brought in destruction upon the world, there were but eight people on that ark, but I guarantee you they were glad they were on that ark, and not outside that ark. Now, why is that written in your Bible in the Old Testament? And how does it help us who are in the ark of safety today, the Lord's church? We don't go around trying to find out what the majority is doing to determine what's right. What makes worship tiring and boring? Well, the only thing that could. When the songs, songs hymns and spiritual songs, or the prayers, the Lord's Supper, and so forth, are done as the Bible says. The only thing that could is the individual whose faith is waning and lack of enthusiasm for doing God's will and showing him according to his will how much they love him. That's when worship becomes boring. It's because of the people's lack of faith. These men who made these comments are all roughly my age. I think Shelley's about a year older than me now. They made them... 30 years or more ago, 40 years ago, some cases. All they were demonstrating was we don't have the same attitude toward the authority of Christ manifested in the Word of God in everything as we once did, and that's true of worship. So these statements suggest that worship, now watch it, must please and suit the one worshiping. They ignore the fact that worship is designed to honor God and that he's legislated in his word how he wants to be honored. When the design of worship is to entertain the worshiper, then we expect those being entertained to show their approval by maybe applause because the church is becoming more worldly. It's becoming less concerned about the authority of the Bible. Thus, it begins to act like the world. And the church becomes a worldly church. Just ask yourself the question, what does it take for the church to become worldly? And must the church apostatize on everything the New Testament teaches about the church before it's wrong? Well, of course not. Any one of us can practice one sin. And if we don't repent of it, knowing full well it's sinful, we're not acceptable to God. So, well, that seems awful strict. God gave Adam and Eve one law and they broke it. And what did that do? One law. What did it do? It separated them from God. Physically, they began to die, and immediately they died as far as God was concerned. Right in the beginning of the Bible, that's what you've got. But people overlook that. We just don't have the attitude towards sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, or the omitting of things God obligates us to do, James 4, 18. We just don't have the attitude towards sin that we need to cultivate. And so it overflows into the worship. Are we concerned about even five acts of worship? Why do we arrive at five acts of worship for the first day of the week assembly? Because we're concerned about what the Bible says and we search the scriptures. We know you can worship on Monday. Why don't we take the Lord's Supper on Monday? Because the only teaching in the New Testament is that it's, a, it's partaken of in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. And that limits the time that it's observed. Well, you have praying and singing and such as that at other times of the week so that you can get in your home. You can have home devotionals, pray and read your Bible and 
talk about things like that. But the further you get away from the appreciation of the authority of God and the Word of God, then the more things like clapping to show approval of things in a worship assembly comes up. I might say it this way, there's as much authority in the New Testament for applause or a clapping in Christian wor worship as there is for playing a piano in the process of worshiping God in music. There's no way in the world you could pick up your New Testament and show me that applause is one of the ways you show approval for anything done in the worship of God. Not if you're writing about the word of truth. You can't do it. It would really satis it would really make things simple if everything that comes up, if we would just learn to ask the question, well, does the Lord authorize that? And if he doesn't, doesn't that settle it? That's exactly what it makes. It makes it easy, but people will come up, well, yeah, but what about this and what about that? Well, you can learn to ascertain Bible authority as well as I can. And if there's no authority in the New Testament for doing it, believing it, or doing it, then don't. Now, that's the way it's right. It can't be wrong, and how important is getting to heaven to you? Furthermore, those among our brethren who first started clapping in worship are the same ones who have decided to stretch the teaching of fellowship to encompass those who are not even members of the Lord's church. And they try to make it sound like that those who are opposed to mechanical instruments of music or whatever other kind of music besides singing in worship are, are weak brethren. It seems to me the only way to determine whether a person is strong in the Lord and simply is fervent love for God and his faithfulness to God is how he adheres to the truth. Look at the chapter in Hebrews, chapter 11, of those great faithful men who were faithful to God under patriarchy and mosaical law. And when it says by faith this one did that and by faith another did this, don't we know that that's put there to say since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, that they were keeping the word of God. That's how you walk by faith. You cannot walk by faith any other way than doing exactly what we're taught. It's also a fact that until recent years it was considered just simply bad taste even among the denominations and other religious people to engage in that kind of thing because it was considered more for football games and ball games and secular entertainment to do that kind of thing. It strikes me that if we can applaud because something happened in the church and it's just another way of saying amen, why can't we have a pep rally? Why can't we have cheerleaders? Well, we almost have when these people come up with worship leaders. You got four people up here directly singing. You got a woman singing alto to lead the altos. You got another woman singing soprano to lead the sopranos, because women mostly sing soprano. You got a man singing bass, and you got a man uh, singing tenor. And they're all up here directing. Well, how in the world does that help anything? How does it expedite the worship? What it does is allow for four people to really put on a show for the rest of them. We've lost sight completely of what worship's all about. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. John, of course, said... Whosoever transgresseth, American standard say, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. Well, I want both the Father and the Son. I'm not ashamed to say that I want to be on the side of the Father and the Son, and I want them to be pleased with me. Well, does that mean I can do what I want to do, regardless of what's said in the Word of God? and decide that I'll just choose how I show God I, I really think highly of him. 
I mean, you might even have a stomp dance. I don't know. If you start this business of saying we can do whatever suits us to please us, where's the end of it? When we lived in Van Buren, Arkansas, some elderly folks, in other words, they were old then as I am now, <laughs> lived right across the road from us. And uh, I remember him telling us one time, they were Methodists. He said, the kids, now you got to remember this is uh, very early 70s, and the hippie movement's still bouncing around. The kids wanted to move all the chairs out of their classroom and sit on the floor and have class. Well, they accommodated them, moved the chairs out and let them sit on the floor. And well, then the next thing was those same young people wanted to move the pews out of the auditorium and have everybody sit on the floor. And that's just how things start, and that wasn't even the church of our Lord. And there's no end to it. And when you're in a denomination where the people basically do as they please anyway, if there's enough of them, then who's to say? If the majority wants to all sit on the floor, they all sit on the floor. Now, some of us have to have some deacons around to help us get up once we got down there. But uh, there's, you know, there's all sorts of uh, work for everybody to do, I guess. <laughs> so the point being this, when we decide that the worship is for us and to please us and to do like we like it, there is no end to it. And our worship that's taught in the New Testament is regulated by the authority of Jesus Christ. And we abide by that. If we can change that, then we can change the plan of salvation. And of course, people have. Thus, you don't see the whole plan of salvation taught by denominations. They say you're saved at the point of faith only without other acts of obedience. Well, that's what happens when you just say we can pick and choose and do what we want to. If hand clapping is something of value in our worship, I simply say, then why didn't God prescribe or authorize it? Could it possibly be that those who initiated this practice think they have thought of something that God overlooked? I remember hearing a preacher of a denomination who when pointed out to him, we have the New Testament as our authority. That's where we know what Christ is pleased with. He's the one who has all authority. He's the head of the church. He purchased the church. And his idea he said, it was this. You can't be up to date. That's a 2,000-year-old book. How are you going to be up to date? God never expected us to stay with something like that that's 2,000 years old. Well, of course, you can imagine what all that view would allow for people doing, no telling what. We seemingly, at least the history proves it, vacillate between binding on people laws that make the doctrine of Christ more strict than God wants it, or running the other direction and loosing people from what God has bound on them. And when you think about it, besides just plain ungodly living, how else would the devil get us away from God if he didn't do something like that? And, of course, Paul said we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, and I have to sometimes say, are we? <laughs> so if a, if a false doctrine is going to be taught, now think about this, a false doctrine is going to be taught and accepted. It must either loose you from what God's Word teaches that you must do or else it must make it more strict and bind on you what God didn't say. How else can it be a false doctrine? Now, you can just not live like the Bible says. My brethren have been doing that for a long time. But I'm talking about when a doctrine is taught that is false. It either binds where God hasn't bound or it looses where God hasn't loosed. That's why we say, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. 
Now listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 through 20. Let no man deceive himself. Well, that's a novel idea, isn't it? We really, when we're deceived, do deceive ourselves. It's believing a lie. That's what happened to Eve. She was deceived. She allowed herself to believe a lie. Let no man deceive himself. If any among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Well, he's comparing the way men think without any help and direction from the real revealed Word of God. People that don't know the Bible, don't care about the Bible, look at what Christians do and say, what a bunch of nuts. Their viewpoint's not the same. They're not converted. They're still in their sins. They're still worldly. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life governs them. But when you're converted, that means you have changed. Your outlook is different. Your will is not to do your will, but to do the Lord's will. And it changes your whole perspective on everything. Before you think about anything or do anything, you want to say, is this pleasing to the Lord? And you know the only way you can find that out is to learn how to study the Bible and understand the authority of Jesus Christ. If not, tell me what Jesus meant when he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Do you think in the last day, John 12, 48, that the Bible's going to the New Testament in particular is going to teach you the difference on worship? It does right now. Of course not. Nor anything else that has to do with Christianity. It's going to read and mean then just how it reads and means now. It doesn't change. It's the infallible Word of God. So those who are really interested in the peace and harmony of the Lord's church will not insist on anything unauthorized by the Bible, and that includes clapping and worship. It's foreign to the Bible. It has nothing to do with keeping the commandments of God. They themselves will agree that Clapping is certainly not necessary in order to have scriptural worship. Well, then why do it? Why just be, you know, Christian? Here's one thing about Christians. They're very content just to do what the Lord wants them to. If you're faithful, that's all you're interested in. Have I pleased my God today? Or did I do something that displeased him? You know, when you look back at Nadab and Abihu under the law of Moses, that shows you how serious it is when it comes to worshiping God. They offered fire that was not authorized to burn incense. That is, the law of Moses didn't authorize them to take that fire. It was called strange fire. Strange wine. Strange to the law of Moses. It came from a place God never intended to come from to do what they did with it. Was that a serious matter? Was that a sobering matter? Well, God killed both of them for it. What about... Christian conduct in the church? What about honesty and integrity? What about telling the truth? Well, just talk to Peter. And then read about what Luke, by inspiration, recorded had happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, just ask yourself the question, why didn't God put that in the Bible for me to read? Because it tells me that when it comes to godly things, it's nothing you trifle with. It's nothing that's light. It's nothing that you just thumb your nose at, halfway engage in it. And we need to teach our children that from the beginning is their conduct and the assembly of the saints. So we need to not only realize that this business of clapping is not authorized by the New Testament, but it is reflecting a general attitude of disrespect for God and the authority of Christ is manifest in the Word of God. It shows you that we are slipping and we're sliding and that we're willing not to ask the question, well, is this authorized? 
I think you would be surprised. We won't try to do that this afternoon. If you went back and read some of the older commentaries from denominational people concerning worship and, this, and the seriousness of it, and see, they were not originally all that happy with it. Same thing's true if you go all the way back to the introduction of mechanical instruments of music into the worship. People were slow to allow that to be done. One of the things that's interesting about seeing some of the old cathedrals that are well over a thousand years old that I have seen in uh, the UK is that when they built those old cathedrals, they didn't have mechanical instruments of music, which in those days usually was a big pipe organ that they put in there. And so when you look at the architecture of the thing, there was no particular place they had made to hold that thing. And so it's there now and has been for hundreds of years. But it doesn't fit the architecture because they had to add it. Well, why? Because they were a cappella. And lo and behold, that means the singing that's done in the chapel. So at one time, none of them used it. Well, when did they start? The further they got away from the authority of the Word of God, the more they added. Same thing's true of sprinkling in the place of a burial or immersion in baptism. And you can go on and on. The organization of the church, how you refer to preachers, and so on. Whatever God's obligated people to do, they figured out there's a better way to do it than God. And you can see it reflected in human churches. And they even go ahead and state it in their own creeds and manuals and prayer books and disciplines, though most of the members don't know that those churches even have those things. Well, we close the lesson by saying I just selected one thing to show, sort of like a thermometer taking the temperature, of just how these things come about. And they come about when people get moved further and further away from respect for the Bible, the authority of it, and how to ascertain that authority how far we will go to keep the truth of God. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one by believing that Christ is the Son of God. Let that belief be built upon, thus saith the Lord, propositions that prove Christ's deity. Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Christ to be the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. As a child of God, if Maybe you've been slipping and things have come into your life that are not authorized by the Scriptures. Then rectify that by repenting and praying for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. And why not do it now if you need? All together we stand and sing.